Daniel Jones is one half of the artist duo Jones Ballet, an artist duo consisting of James Ballet and Daniel Jones. Their collaborative practice explores the boundaries of sound art, music, and process-based composition. Their work draws on systems and patterns from the world around us as ways of organizing sound, creating a reciprocal relationship between the two, using sound as a way to illuminate our understanding of the world and using natural processes as a way to deepen our approaches to composition. John's Valley's critically acclaimed work has been shown at venues including the Royal Festival Hall, the Barbican, the Museum of Science and Industry, Alderberg Music, the Old Royal Naval College, the Queen Elizabeth Hall, and the Design Museum. Please let's welcome Daniel Jones. Hello, thank you for having me. Um, can you see the desktop okay? Yeah, great, okay, perfect. Um, yeah, hello, uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks Saloni for an amazing, uh, super inspiring talk. I'd love to um, talk more about this offline, some really impressive work. Um, so I'm going to be talking today for about half an hour about an installation project um, called Living Symphonies. And the concept behind the piece is that it attempts to portray the growth and interactions within a forest ecosystem um, in the form of a sound installation that takes place within the forest itself. Uh, so it is an ongoing piece uh, created um, by myself and James Bully. This is us. Uh, Jones Bully um, and we've had a practice now for maybe 13 years in which we've created a whole range of different works. So we first met um, at Goldsmiths as postgrads uh, where we were both kind of working at this intersection of sound and generativity so thinking about ways in which we can use patterns and processes from the world around us as a way to kind of go beyond our normal practice as composers so both as ways to kind of illustrate hidden patterns from the world around us, but also as a way to deepen our approach to composition. So really introspect and think about what it means to be a composer. So what do we do when we compose a pattern or a refrain? How can we express those underlying musical structures in an automated system that can then bring in agency from the world around us as a way to kind of go beyond the normal kind of, you know, linear constraints of composition. So the first piece that we created, just to give a kind of couple of minutes of, of background. So this is a photo of a sound installation called Variable 4 um, that was created first back in 2010 and here shown on the um, Barbara Hepworth lawn at Snape Maltings on the east coast of England. The idea behind this piece was that it was capturing real time data from weather conditions. So wind, rain, sunshine, humidity, uh, temperature, pressure, um, and feeding those into a system as a way to kind of direct the composition so that it would reflect real time changes in the weather conditions. Um, it ran over a 24 hour period, uh, a few different locations. Um, and the kind of notion of it was in the, you know, in the legacy of aleatoric composers you know ever since Mozart's dice games composers have been using chance processes as a way to kind of uh, expand their composition and remove you know the agency of the self the ego from the compositional process the notion here was to remove the self but replace it by um, the invisible kind of agency of forces from the physical world um, but the key thing that we were kind of aiming for, just as Saloni, you were saying, it's really important to have a kind of narrative that can bring in the audience. We were trying to use this to create a composition that sounded as if it was traditionally orchestrated, as if there were, you know, an invisible conductor. So we drew on, you know, the musical language of uh classical composition, equal tempered composition, um, and controlled that through this external data, uh, external sensor data as a kind of emergent force that would treat this something like a sonification, sonifying these uh, real time data streams, but with deep uh, kind of layers of artistic interpretation, which are shown in this uh, diagram. So this was the notation system that we developed for variable four. And as you can see, it will kind of move between each of these individual cells based on combinations of weather conditions um, through daytime, dusk and night and back again. So with this kind of long-term circadian rhythm. Um, in the wake of that, we've um, 
developed a few other kind of large scale sound installations. So this is a piece called Maelstrom, which draws on thousands of hours of audio material taken from, from around the world, from user contributed audio websites to create a kind of global illustration of all of the complexity of global acoustic ecosystems. Um, we also worked with radio systems in this piece, Radio Reconstructions, which tunes into real time weather conditions, uh, sorry, real time radio broadcasts um, and re-sculpts those into a kind of real time collaged composition. Um, again, taking invisible landscapes around us and rendering them um, audible in this case and kind of fostering attentiveness to these aspects of the world and trying to re-sculpt them and reshape them and show them in different perspectives. Um, I guess the kind of common aspect that all of these have in common is that we're really interested in emergence and complex systems and these kind of dynamics um, and forces that uh, can give rise to really quite creative and sophisticated um, outputs. And it was that that drew us to working with forest ecosystems. And this is really the kind of um, subject of living symphonies. So maybe the paradigmatic example of a self-organizing ecosystem in which there's no, you know, there's no centralized organizer behind um, any ecology. It's the interactions of millions of years of evolution and untold numbers of organisms and plants interacting, feeding on each other, growing, creating shade, responding to weather conditions, constantly in this kind of dynamic equilibrium, um, which shifts and changes over time. But to our eyes, it's, you know, one of the most sublime and beautiful and sophisticated kind of products of, um, you know, in the universe in many ways. So we were kind of moving towards composing for this uh, and then in 2013, we were commissioned by the Forestry Commission to create a nationwide touring piece, which um, came to be called Living Symphonies. Um, I think the best way to show this is to play a short video. So this is about a three minute explainer that will kind of take you through the piece and give you an idea of how it sounds uh, in situ. <laughs> it's OK. Great.
So everything that you heard um, in that short video um, were snippets of field recordings made of the piece over four different um, forests made uh, throughout the 2014 um, tour of the piece. And what's kind of um, a continual source of reward for us as composers is the way that because it's generated and recomposed in real time from so many thousands of tiny fragments, it's constantly developing new refrains and melodies and counterpoints and so forth. So it continues to be kind of rewarding and generative, which means that it's uh, it's an interesting challenge to document, but we tend to do so by making recordings in the forest itself to kind of give a snapshot. There's no substitute for being out there, of course, in the environment and listening to it, but um, at least it gives a, a flavor. Um, there we go. So in the rest of the talk, I'm gonna be talking about living symphonies um, through um, a few different lenses. Uh, so it's both composing for an ecosystem and really composing as an ecosystem, because as we've come to develop this piece over the past um, 10 years, actually we've realized that this in itself is a very ecological process with really strong feedback loops between not just the people who work on the piece, but it's different facets. So I'm gonna be talking about um, the role that time plays within the composition, um, the environment, uh, data and data sources um, within the piece, the role of space, um, and finally the role of frequency. Um, but of course, all of the above, there's feedback loops between them, so we'll be kind of moving um, back and forth a little bit through the presentation. So firstly, time, you know, I think this was one of the um, things that really drew us to working in this kind of installation format, the fact that you can create very long durational works in which the audience can kind of engage over as short or long as time scale as they like, potentially returning to the piece, uh, you know, being able to experience it in different temporal um, contexts. And of course, there's a really fundamental um, parallel that we wanted to draw out, which is why we first started talking about um, forest ecosystems between the forest and um, an orchestral score. So at the very top level, so this is, um, Beethoven symphony, um, which um, has a duration, you know, in the low uh, of about an hour, kind of um, rough order of magnitude. A symphony is then subdivided into um, individual movements, which themselves are subdivided into individual bars, which are themselves subdivided into individual notes, um, which are themselves the product of very short repeating cycles, which give them their frequency. But it's this kind of multi-layered kind of stratified format that we found really interesting because um, this is really what gives us as a, a listener a kind of long-term engagement with the piece, the repeated motifs um, that allow us to kind of spot patterns and refrains and develop a emotional engagement within a piece of music. But the same could be said um, about a forest, of course. A forest can have a lifespan in the centuries or even millennia in the case of some um, uh, yew trees, for example, that can last for thousands of years. Um, there are time scales in the decades of ground flora in the years of small um, birds and mammals, um, and then down to the days um, of uh, midges and mayflies. And so you can start to think of the forest in the same kind of fractal-like encapsulation of timescales within timescales. And so we became really interested in how we could start to reflect that same multi-level temporal process um, in a musical composition. Could we actually um, start to reflect those different timescales? And this, I really like to quote from um, Semiconductor, who was speaking two weeks ago, who asked, how can we experience geological timescales within our human timescale, which I think is a fantastic uh, question and kind of thought experiment. Um, and really, we're trying to ask some of these same questions within this composition. You know, we're not, we're not time stretching or condensing, but we're trying to consider, you know, the temporal perspective um, of a Douglas fir or the temporal perspective of a mycorrhizal network. How can we reflect each of those musically, sonically, and then create something in which you, as a listener, can then kind of zoom in or zoom out and kind of orally explore and reflect on the kind of juxtaposition of those different timescales. Um, and of course, as a forest visitor, that means that there's also a circadian day and night cycle. And so this is 
um, a night walk um, at Cannock Chase in the Midland, uh, in which we invited people to come and listen to the piece as darkness fell. And of course, all of the crepuscular and nocturnal animals started to emerge and suddenly the piece transforms into this completely different form, which is a particularly kind of rewarding time to listen, not least because, you know, as night falls, our oral senses kick in and we can then engage that much more deeply, kind of on a non-visual level. Um, the second aspect that I'd like to introduce is the environment, of course, itself, which is really core to, um, you know, any of the locations has a very strong sense of place. And this is always where we start by citing living symphonies, figuring out what makes, um, what really kind of um, personifies a forest. And this always begins with us trying to explore the environment with the people who, you know, uh, work and reside within the forest and find the perfect location that has this mix of um, kind of ecological diversity so an area within the forest that's um that represents all of the um kind of variety of plant life and animal life that um, exemplifies the forest um a location that also gives you a bit of a kind of sense of journey um and really allows you to experience the forest um with this sort of buffer away from your day-to-day -day life as you journey um within it there have been six different locations that Living Symphonies has been located over the past six years. Um, four as part of the Forestry Commission tour, so Thetford Forest, Fine Shade Woods, Cannock Chase and Bedgebury Pine Eatum, um, which even amongst themselves had an incredible diversity. And this for us has been a learning in terms of um, quite how varied the different sort of geologies and um, uh, ecologies are that make up the different layers of forest and some of these you know were working forests they were man-made forests originally which have um s still uh are used to grow woodstock to this day some of them are kept much more wild for, so for example Ep epping forest um in london um the area of epping that we actually um ended up settling on um has an incredible kind of multi-layered um ecosystem because trees when they fall are simply left so they're not cleared um, as in a working forest and so this creates incredible habitats for ground uh, insects um, and then last year we took the piece to Compton Verney in Warwickshire um, and we were very fortunate to be able to use this beautiful um, uh, coppice in a sort of indented uh, bowl shaped land many thanks to the farmers uh, who actually own that patch of land because they they protect it very much for um, rewilding effectively and, and, and making it as kind of um, wildlife friendly as possible and for us that was a really magical location um, to be able to take the piece to. Um, one of the things that I think it's really important to say is that we always try to um, act as respectfully as possible to the location um, in this uh, scene. I think this was us in Thetford Forest um, in um, Suffolk and we were consulting with Neil Armathalou, who is the ecologist from the forest. And it's always really important for us to be able to select a site that is not going to be too um, susceptible to footfall and fragile. Um, and in fact, in um, again, in Cannock Chase in the Midlands, we had a perfect location for the piece. But unfortunately, we were told that there were some rare nesting wrens, um, which were going to be... Um, in situ there uh, when the installation was taking place. So we very quickly backed off um, and found a new location. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, we always try to encourage a sense of journey um, out into the woodlands um, as much as possible. The other thing to say um, about the environment and the ecology is that one of the motivations behind the piece is really to encourage an equal kind of footing and level of attentiveness to the whole level of um, you know, complex interactions that make up the ecosystem. So not glorifying just the red kites and red deer, but also elevating the vital work that um, fungal networks do and beetle colonies and so on and so forth. So we try to elevate all of these to the same level. And really a key part of um, our motivation behind the piece is to encourage people to kind of attend a bit more closely um, to the environment around them and maybe you know take a pause um for example the piece of course being in 
active areas of woodlands attack, attract cyclists and dog walkers and people who walk through the woodland each day and maybe don't stop so much to um just really sit for for an hour or a few hours um to attend to the to the woodlands around them um the third factor is space and so one of the interesting things about this composition is that it's really fundamentally spatial so um the piece is a 24 channel spatial um sound installation which takes place across a 30 by 20 meter area of the woodland which we found to be about right to kind of encourage this spatial um interaction as you can see here people um walk around the woodland because really there's no one sweet spot as in a typical ambisonic composition ideally you want to be sat dead in the middle of a speaker array in this case we use completely ad hoc arrays of speakers really distributed wherever the forest allows and that really encourages people to remain mobile within the forest um so each species is represented through a set of musical motifs which we'll talk more about shortly um but the important thing is is that all of those motifs are located where you're likely to hear that species so for example up on the top of a poplar tree where we might have a speaker mounted you will hear the poplar refrain playing um if there is a patch of um mahonia a ground flora um then you would hear that emanating from the ground there and in the case of animals we're actually able to animate the movements of those species so using this speaker system we can pan the sounds around the space which will encourage people to um you know first listen to the the motion um, which we've tried to model on the real movement patterns of um, insects, mammals and birds that might be moving through the space, but also maybe to um, physically engage with it. Maybe you're following the sounds around and or trying to, you know, imagine um, the animal that might be being portrayed by the movement um, of the sound. So there's an awful lot of um, diagramming and sketching and trying to kind of understand the physical layout of the woodlands as best we can. Um, we distribute the speakers fairly evenly through ground, um, mid-height, and then canopy speakers, some as high as 30 metres um, if the canopy um, permits. Um, and as you can see here, so this is um, one of our canopy speakers installed up a fir tree. Uh, typically we'll work with arborists who will um, shin up a tree um, and managed to take one of these speakers up um, into the canopy where it's concealed. Um, and it's quite an amazing experience, you know, to experience a full 3D immersion in audio. And I think quite unique to some of the people who, you know, have, have probably never um, been to a spatial audio performance, but maybe within the uh, sort of more accessible environment of the woodlands, um, they can experience spatial audio and start to start to start to realize the um added dimension that it provides um but it's really important for us as well that this isn't a technological piece there's a lot of technology behind it there are computers and amps and um simulations and data but really we want the experience for the listener to be as pure as possible and for it to be almost almost a sense of the music emanating magically from the woodlands around them so um what our team will do is they'll build these fantastic organic hides, particularly for the ground flora, to make them as invisible, um, invisibly concealed as possible. Um, you can see here a, a beautiful piece of work um, from the kit mapper um, team who've, who've used a kind of bed of moss and um, bark to conceal this with a proof speaker. Um, and as I said, this really does encourage people to then kind of engage with the piece in quite a kind of physical way and that does extend of course to um full you know families looking up trying to imagine what the sound is coming um from the canopy speakers like kids love dashing around trying to find where the speakers are um but on top of that they'll then kind of go beyond that to start imagining what is this what is this sound what does it what does this portray and really thinking about um the the, the animals they might not typically appreciate within um the woodlands we also work with a blind practitioner, Andy Shipley. Um, so on a few uh, installations, we've run a, an event that Andy stages called Super Sense. And this is really encouraging people to engage with the woodland in a non-sighted way. So you don um an eye mask and then after you've kind of habituated, um, walk through the forest led by Andy and engage just through the senses of touch 
and sound and smell, which is quite um, an incredible thing because it really does open up all those different sensory pathways. And it's quite, um, yeah, an amazing way to experience the forest in a new sensory light. Um, and of course, the theme um, of this seminar series is the data. And actually, it's been really interesting as we've developed the piece to understand um, that the data and the ways in which we work with it really are quite a major fundamental um, uh, as an art material, actually, you might say. And it's worth um, saying that there's a wonderful thesis by Julie Freeman, the artist called Data as an Art Material. Um, and Julie writes about um, about exactly that, the, the different ways in which we can kind of categorize and understand and uh, perceive data through its use. Um, as, a, as, a, as a medium, both in uh, acoustic composition or in visual composition, um, as in some of her work. Um, we build up the data for each installation of Living Symphonies through a kind of few step process. First, we do a very detailed meter by meter survey of the ground flora, as you can see here. So stepping through each um, meter of the site and understanding where each tree is, the distribution of other ground flora. Um, make very heavy use of these wonderful field guides and get to a point where we have this complete 30 by 20 meter ground survey, which we can then feed into a software system that effectively abstracts the site into a kind of perfect-ish map. So this is Thetford Forest, shows the distribution of ash trees, hawthorns, uh, sycamores, pine trees, and all of the ground flora. Um, counterpart to that, of course, is the fauna. And this is where it gets really interesting because you know, we the only way to truly understand the fauna moving through the site and its um, change over the seasons and change in response to other conditions is through observations. But we can't do that on our own. So we work with teams like this. Um, so this um, is an amazing group that um, came to work on the Compton Verney installation last year. We've also worked with the Friends of Epping Forest, the Friends of Canic Chase. And effectively, these are local enthusiasts and um, forest um, evangelists who love the forest, love the space, pass through it each day and are themselves, even though they might not all be trained ecologists, are experts in what happens within the forest. They can tell you where the chaffinches are nesting, where the moles come out, where there are, uh, how often jackdaws are going to be passing overhead and the kinds of things that you really can't know without simply being in the forest for long stretches of time. And it's this kind of anecdotal data that really has come into becoming a key part of how we conceptualize the piece. You know, this is citizen science um, or what Chan Lee um, et al called local ecological knowledge, kind of local specialists who can tell you all about the woodlands, uh, even though they might have no formal training. Um, uh, the other term that I really like that I came across recently is warm data by Nora Bateson. Um, Gregory Bates and the cybernetician's um, daughter, who talks about data not just being the cold, you know, cold data of this kind of numerical data that comes from a weather station, but the embodied data of interrelations and interconnections and temporal changes and the subjective qualitative parts of a data set, which only really come out um, through distributed human observation. And so we've actually now established quite a practice of simply asking people to record observations, which you can see here, um, not a nut hatch called from a tree trunk. An otter um, prints were found um, over the river on the 5th of October. And data like this for us is just fantastic because it gives such a, um, you know, organic portrayal of the area, which we can then feed into the ecosystem model, which you, we use to drive the piece and create this kind of patchwork collective illustration of the location, which I think is just a really beautiful kind of product of all of this, you know, the ecology of humans that um, inhabit the site. Um, of course, we do also need cold data. So this is a weather station which um, feeds in real time, the real time atmosphere conditions, as I mentioned. Um, and we're moving towards using more uh, fine grained distributed sensing um, for the subsequent installations of Living Symphonies. This allows us to then um, parameterize the piece to respond to what's going on in the woodland in real time. Um, and that's using this. So. Um, Hopefully it should be clear by now, but of course we're not able to track where every individual organism within the woodlands is on a day-to-day -day basis, but we can 
model and simulate that and that's really what this kind of software system behind the piece is doing so we know that on a sunny day there might be buzzards in the thermals overhead uh, and this then runs in real time and the final section which i'll try and step through quickly so i know i'm slightly coming to the end of time um, is in the frequency domain so we've talked about composing over time we've talked about composing over space but of course the third dimension when you're thinking about sound is in frequency and how we're filling up different bands um, of frequency space and so this is um, a spectrogram from a real world physical environment in which you've got time on the x-axis and frequency which is kind of like pitch on the y-axis and the way that we've really started thinking about living symphonies is trying to compose from different niches of this kind of frequency spectrum just in the way that a well um, a healthy forest ecosystem should have a good balance of frequencies spread across the woodland. And it's a great way of diagnosing the health of an ecosystem. We try to mirror that um, within the composition. And so these are some uh, scores, notated scores for various different instruments that inhabit different bands of the frequency range. Um, this is for arachnid, I think. Um, and uh, this then gets played by a whole array, dozens of different um, human um, musicians, which we then fragment and break into um, tiny elements, which we can then use to fill up that kind of frequency um, spectrum. And really, you, you know, this is um, where the piece kind of forms its expression um, and allows people to interpret all of these um, different species which are portrayed within the compositions, which species typically would be played by one um, musician on one instrument and with occasional synthetic elements for the very high and low um, frequency bands. Um, yep, and here we have Simon Hewitt-Jones, Katie English, Peter Gregson on cello, Keir Vine, um, uh, David Aird and Tulare Dyer on harp, amongst many, many other amazing musicians. Um, and this is really it. So by collaging all of these different elements, bringing in, you know, the subjective warm data by bringing in all of these um, fragments of music and then conducting these parts together through um, a real-time simulation. We're able to create a real-time, what we hope is, you know, a portrayal um, of the complex web of interactions within the forest, both on a spatial scale and on a temporal scale. Um, and um, by playing that within the forest, it really enables you to kind of... Um, um, attend to the to, to the forest through the through the work itself we do make sure that we're not um you know we're not overriding the soundscape of the forest we play the piece at a fairly low volume level and with a fairly um generous use of silence because it's really designed to accompany the woodland rather than mask the woodland um, and that's a really important part for us to encourage listening to the natural woodland soundscape um, and open up the interpretation of that um, as well. And finally, just to loop really quickly back to time. So one of the things that we've kind of become really aware of as composers over the 10 or so years of working on the composition is that this in itself is a very slow cybernetic feedback process process for us you know our understanding of the peace and of ourselves and of ecology and you know the environment itself has changed a lot in that past 10 years and so for us as artists it's really nice to have now this kind of long-term temporal feedback loop as we develop the piece and bring new agencies um into it and every time it in itself evolves um and grows and that was everything. I just wanted to end on this beautiful um, thing that we discovered. So for us, the most rewarding um, thing in many ways is being able to spend time in the forest and explore the woodlands. And this is what we discovered. It's called Foxfire um, in the woodlands of Epping Forest, where we were staying very late one night to make some recordings. And we saw this eerie glow from within the forest floor. And so this is a bioluminescent fungi, which lives on decaying wood. Um, and it's glow, it glows like this effectively to attract insects to disperse its spores throughout the woodland. And we just thought this was such a beautiful symbol, um, you know, for what we were trying to express within um, living symphonies and the kind of unexpected beauty that nature keeps um, presenting to us. 
Um, if you're interested in reading more, so we do have a website for the piece, Um James's PhD thesis is an amazing read on sounding materiality. Um, and if you're more interested in the kind of augmenting composition and generative processes, um, this is an article that I've just shared on my website actually many years ago called The Extended Composer that talks about how we can go beyond our natural compositional um, tendencies through process and data. Um, thank you very much for your time.